Matt, I'll speak to you when you're next uh, next available, okay? Matt, uh, I will have a look at my schedule, and uh, if there's a tiny opening, maybe I will come by and visit you and uh, introduce you to one of my best friends. He's certainly, and mate, he's got two names, Nun and Chaka. <laughs> yeah, mate. Matt, i tell you what, Matt, next time we talk, Matt, I will not charge you my appearance for you, mate. Mate, that's good because... Uh, I don't know where I was going to get 15 cents from. Welcome to On Board for Delivery. All right. Welcome to On Board for Delivery. Uh, we've got a special guest tonight. Some of you may remember him as Guido Hassis, the self-obsessed ARIA-winning Greek Adonis, who electric boogaloo and kickboxing champion. Or some of you may be more familiar with his most recent work as 3AW Overnights. But if I was to mention to you, the JC93 is a single shaft axial. Oh, stuff that one up. Okay. <laughs> the JC93 so close, is a. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, I'll get it right. Axial. Okay. The JC93 is a single shaft axial. axial what is it? Axial what? Axial flow. The JC93 is a single shaft axial flow turbojet with a variable strata processor compressor. Okay, I'll get it right this time. If I was to tell you the JC93, <laughs> Tim's looking at this going, I haven't got any idea I'm what like, you're I'm like, we're going to leave all this in, Paul. This is, this, yeah, is, like, this is gold. This is the no, best no. bit. Should have turned up to <laughs> rehearsal. If I was to tell you the JC93 is a... Okay. If I was to tell you the JC93 is a... Uh, uh, sorry. If I was to tell you the General Electric JC93 is an axial single shaft... Ax Why can't, I did it 500 times today. You're getting it. No you're, problem. You're, you're almost a qualified aircraft engineer. Okay, we'll get it. Okay. But if I was to tell you the General Electric JC93 is a single shaft axial flow turbojet with a variable strata compressor and a fully variable convergent and divergent exhaust nozzle, would you know what I'm talking about? No, but our next guest does. He has got a passion for all things aircraft, which has led him to write for Australian Aviation Magazine. And it's a pleasure to have this Turkish heel spinning, snap kicking, souvlaki eating genius on the show. So welcome, Tony Guido Moclair. Thank you, Tim. Thank end. you, Paul. It's a, an absolute <laughs> delight to be here. So you were talking about an engine there. Um, I was. From, from memory, I that was. sounds like an early generation jet engine. Um, the divergent yep. nozzle being the what they would call an afterburner which just measures the flow of energy at the back when it's open. Fuel is going into the hot gases being ejected from the end of the engine and that gives it more power. And so you need a nozzle to open up. It's a mm -hmm. pretty fascinating thing. Aircraft engines are amazing. I think that's from the, the Valkyrie, something to do with the Valkyrie. Oh, no, that was a J7. But, but you're right. Now there's a very interesting story about mm. that. Mm. Um, the last time, one of the last times the US Air Force ever did an air-to-air -air publicity shot because they crashed. One plane with, you know, one of the most experienced test pilots in the Air Force crashed in the, bat of, in the back of the Valkyrie. The test pilot died and the Valkyrie went in and only one person got out. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's a pleasant note upon which to start. Let's move on. I don't know why I brought that up. <laughs> no, that's, that's the whole point of this show. We, we get to nerd out about anything technology-related. So, Excellent. Um, I think I heard a similar, well, not a, I don't think anyone died, but it was either the F, I think it was the F-15 or the F-22. Yeah. Uh, one of the test flights for those. I think they had a crash as well. I don't know if you recall well, which one Well, the F-22 did, and there's pretty amazing video footage of it. They had um, uncommanded oscillations in the tailplane, I think it was. So it started, it took off, and there must have been a software error because it's a, it's a software-driven aeroplane, and um, it just started porpoising. And uh, the pilot got out, but it was pretty early on in the test program. Um, but yeah, like you say, it was F-22 and the pilot lived, hmm. which is good news. I get, I get a feeling it was probably developed, this, well, the software was probably developed by the same people that developed Microsoft Flight Sim. Because uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul was flying, Paul's rudder just stopped yeah. working. His plane would just fly to the left every wow. time. It's uncontrollable. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah it's broken. Right. Look, I am... I am, um, I'm in the process of getting rudder pedals, hopefully, for my birthday yeah. coming up on Friday. So all, all things being uh, good, hopefully I can get some of them. But I've got, you'd be impressed, Tony, I've got a, a, almost a full cockpit set up here. <laughs> I've got my yoke. I've got 
I'm hopefully getting the rudder pedals. I've got my throttle quadrant. I've got the whole, I've got the gaming chair, which kind of feels like a bit of a, an air, airplane chair. Yeah. I've got the whole lot. And so how <laughs> deep into that do you go? Do you pre, you pre-flight, you obviously don't do a walk around or can you do a virtual walk around of the aircraft? Yeah. So you can, so for me at the moment, because my knowledge is pretty, you know, I've got a, I was talking to my kids about this and I said, I've got a passion for aviation, but, but nowhere near to the degree that you do. Right. So you've got, you know, the engine model numbers and, and which airplanes are no longer in existence. I don't know all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's more about just starting on the runway and getting up in the air and just having a good time. Yeah. But you can, you can do pretty much, um, you can't do a walk around at, but there are certain mods you probably could use to do that, but you certainly can do, um, you know, the full pre-flight checklist, yeah. um, all that kind of stuff. You've got, um, there's certain mods, which I haven't downloaded, which allow you to have passengers on board ah, and, okay. you know, you have to actually look after them and give them food and make sure they have all the right amenities. Wow. And then at the end you get a score. So you can pretty much take it as far as you want. Yeah. But Tim and I just fly through New York and try not to hit the buildings. That's what we do with it. But <laughs> okay. With yeah, the, that's with the jet stuff that you can't do. Yeah. Stuff that you can't do in real life, but yeah. uh, it made me think, are you into the, the whole you know, aviation for you, is it just a, a passion? Is it, it, would you, do you, um, do you like actually flying? Do you want to be a pilot? What, where's it stop for you? Um, that's a good question. I, I've never done the sim thing. Um, I've had a couple of flight lessons, but enough to know that I probably wouldn't trust myself. And, and by that, yeah. I mean, um, I don't think I'd react well if an engine stopped or that sort of thing. Maybe I'm just making excuses, but look, if I retire with a lot of super, it's something I'd love to do. I'd love to just get a, you know, basic pilot's license, um, VFR, yeah. you know, nothing, nothing too fancy. Um, but for me, it's about, oh, the dimension, the, the, the scope of it is um, aircraft history, aviation history, especially World War II, anything beyond, let's say <coughs> 1935 when, Aircraft were made of metal rather than fabric. Biplanes don't do anything for me at all. Um, well, World War One era ones. I'm currently building a model aircraft of a of a, a uh, swordfish. So I love aircraft model building, which is very sexy. I get that, ladies. Take a number. Um, and photography as well is one thing. So going to Avalon and and other air shows to take uh, photographs of planes is a big thing. And I've got a group of plane mates, and we get together as well, I guess as often as we can and just um, talk about planes and end up having, mm. you know, robust disagreements about military aircraft. So it's it's pretty broad, <laughs> I would say, but yeah, it's, it's stop short of actually learning how to fly them. Yeah. So do you have a, a favourite? Um, so in terms of military aircrafts, um, yeah. what, do you have a favourite or a top, a top three or top five? Oh, I'd have, oh, geez, I'd definitely have a top five. Uh, the F-111 would be in there. The TSR-2, which was a British strike aircraft developed by the company that went on to help develop the Concorde. Um, same engines, but uh, it, it got cancelled. Um, the Spitfire is an enduring favourite because, because of what an incredible design story that was to go from uh, 1936, I think, when it first flew, all the way to 1945 and beyond. It was finally retired in 1950. But in that, there were 22 different marks. And then there's sub-variants of that. RJ Mitchell, the whole story of him dying of cancer when he was designing it, and the fact that he never got to see it in its moment of glory in the Battle of Britain. And then an unheralded, an unheralded, unheralded genius, um, uh, Joseph Smith, Pretty sure that was his name. He became the chief designer at Vickers. And from the Mark I, he developed it right through to, they got up to about the Mark 24, and then there was the C5 variant. So they went from the Merlin, they developed that as far as they could, and then went to the Griffin. And it was a really incredible design story. So, the, you know, everyone knows, of course, the story of the, uh, the, the Spitfire from the Battle of Britain. But what it achieved after that was also pretty remarkable. I do like aeroplanes, but is there anything better than listening to someone who really, really cares about what they do? Absolutely. I, I love nerding out. And you like usually the, the things that we're interested in probably 
Tony might agree with aviation. Other people just don't care about. So no one, no one wants to listen. Yeah, I don't know. true. Well, uh, apart from family, obviously, family must love aviation. Oh, Your family oh, must oh, really oh. get into it. Um, mm. Not really. Especially your wife. Yeah. yeah that, no, my, my wife's reached her limit. We went to an air show during a honeymoon. And <laughs> I mean, like any man, I, well, I think it's an, it's, it's an extraordinary act of love to give your wife, your new wife, a walking tour of a Singaporean air to air refueling capable Hercules. And I did that. Exactly. And yeah. Um, if that doesn't set your You're marriage on the right foundation, I don't know what will. But um, my family, not so much into it. Um, although the boys in my family, especially, I come from a big family, and the boys uh, tend to be obsessive about things. Um, I've got an older brother who's really into music, I've got a younger brother who's really into music, and the brother just above me is is obsessed with cricket and sport. So he used to... Um, he would invent games like pencil cricket and just spend hours doing these imaginary games mm. of cricket and, and can tell you Dennis Lilly's bowling figures for the 1978 Ashes test or whatever it might be. Um, and then he would also, when he went to the bathroom, he would stay in there. Keep in mind there were 10 people using one bathroom, but Pete would monopolise it um, doing these... <laughs> commentaries on tests in which he <laughs> was holding the line against the West Indies. The batting order had collapsed, but somehow it was only Pete Moclair who was able to dig Australia out of trouble. So he would, in the <laughs> toilet, um, be in there for an hour and you would hear him commentating, which was always um, <laughs> distressing for me because it was my job to bring him in the drinks. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so it, which I think I've probably used on the Sam Pang thing. Um, so it, there was that kind of environment. It was just kind of, I don't know. I, a mate and I got into trucks at school. And then from there, we both got into military aviation. Mm. He diverged from the true path, but I stayed on it with a slight, I don't know, vacation when, when girls became all important, but um you know, the correct order reasserted itself and and then I, I went back to the fold. Well, one thing that's always fascinated me about planes, you might even know the answer, Tony. How do they, how do they know they fly? So if they're creating new planes now yeah, or new planes for the future, like that, do they take them up to see if they're going to fly first? How do they know they're going to fly? Well, uh, so that's another good question. What's, What's happened in the, uh, let's say, last 20, 30 years, possibly more, but let's call it 30 years, has just been the rise of software, as I mentioned earlier. Mm. CAD CAM, as you guys would know all about, that came in in about the 80s. And so you can, with certain aircraft, you can know exactly to the millimetre how it's going to fly thanks to projections. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, thanks to supercomputing power and that sort of thing. So it's it's not so much the guessing game that it was, let's say, during World War II when it was um, men in white shirts smoking pipes at drawing boards. Yeah. Um, when genuine uh, design problems were found when the aircraft was taken up, these days the surprise is almost eliminated out of it because who needs that kind of surprise when you're dealing with a, you know, billion-dollar aircraft? So, yeah. um, uh, so there's, there's wind testing, which is enormous. That was pioneered, or at least that's been around since the 1930s. The Germans had incredible wind, wind tunnels in uh, the 1930s, really elaborate things. So that, yeah, right. sort of thing is, that kind of aerodynamic research has been around for a long time. Um, mm. There's also a lot of knowns in, in terms of aircraft configuration. If you put a certain, if you put an engine in a certain place, there are pros and cons to that. If you have a wing shape, yeah, right. there's pros and cons to that. So it's 
I guess oftentimes it's a variation or a combination of all of those kind of forces interacting. But what really gets interesting about aircraft types is the, and this sounds really mundane, but it is actually really interesting, I think it is, yep. is how air behaves as it flows around an object moving through space. Yeah. And so much design effort goes into mitigating the uh, downsides of that or the, um, and mitigating stress on the airplane. If you look at the cowling um, of an aircraft engine, let's say you're on a 737 and there's this kind of sharp blade sticking out of the, the cowling um, just near where the nacelle, as it's called, joins the engine to the wing. That's all there to break up the energy in the air going over the wing so that it doesn't stress the the empennage or the sorry the nacelle that's holding the engine to the wing. So all the, and what's what again what's more fascinating about that is how all of that knowledge has been accrued through accidents, through testing. Um, so what you know what you see vir virtually in every aircraft is is the legacy of all the research and accidents that yeah. have been before. Yeah. Well, I also know that a lot of the, the latest uh, fighter jets, I know the uh, F-22, the F-35, yep. they're actually built to be unstable. And it, it, and without yes. the software, they wouldn't yep. fly properly. They're not, they're not aerodynamic in, in the sense that they will just glide. They will, yeah, they won't, they'll be uncontrollable, I believe, if, without That's the software. Right. Yeah. It's called relaxed stability. And that comes from the 1970s. That was, I think the F-16 was the pioneer of that. Um, so you can make an aerodynamic aircraft like the F-117. That, that should not be able to fly, that thing. It is not designed, as you say, to... It would have the, it would have the glide properties of a brick, but there are computers making <laughs> thousands of corrections a second or a minute to, um, to make that possible. Um, and so it makes possible a whole new uh era, range of uh maneuvers and uh, maneuverability in aircraft and um it, it's now the it's kind of the design standard now mm. so are you i think tim's daughter has come yeah. to say hello i'll, I'll come out a little bit I'll I'll see. what I'll um sorry you said you went from, from trucks to planes yeah uh oh. trucks just didn't once you saw a plane, it just took over. Trucks just didn't do it for you anymore. Yeah, it was a bit like that. There was uh, there was a book on World War Two, which I really got into, and then there were just pictures of World War Two planes, which I'm yeah. still obsessed with. Um, and that they just had a lot more allure, I think, than trucks, which I still think are pretty amazing. But yeah. uh, you know, when it's said and done, um, a Kenworth is not just doesn't quite have the I don't know the the rugged appeal of an F eighteen with a yeah. couple of J dams hanging off and an AIM one thirty two on both wingtips, and there's you know there's the noise and the power and all of that sort of thing that goes yeah that goes with that. And but the, maybe you know at the time we were living in Mildura and Dad would fly down to Melbourne and then come back and we would go to the airport to pick him up and he'd come back in an F twenty seven a Fokker Friendship and just the noise of that thing of those beautiful Rolls Royce Dart turboprops just whining in the night. And just the lights going. It was just something far more captivating about that than than trucks. It was, yeah, mm. it just got its hooks into me a lot deeper than trucks did. I do notice that with, with especially with with my kids, if a plane goes over the top, everyone always goes and looks up. But when yeah. there's a truck going past, no one really pays that much attention, do they? No. You might no. get the whole you know thing that people do, but <laughs> you always look for a plane, always. Yeah. 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 Um, what about helicopters? Uh, do you get into those as well or more the planes? Yeah, it's it's more the planes. Although there is, I don't know if you guys have seen it. There's a, I think it's Sikorsky who have put this thing out. It's got a tail rotor that's perpendicular. So it's like that. On the end of the boom, the tail boom, it's got a propeller. And then I think there's, a, there's an anti-torque propeller as well. Um, this thing is unbelievable to watch flying. It's uh, there's a whole new bunch of design ideas involved, and it is incredibly manoeuvrable. And it's possibly the next U.S. Army combat helicopter. I certainly hope so, because it's absolutely thrilling to watch. But the number of choppers I like or, or get really interested in, I could pretty much count on one hand. They they generally don't do it for me for whatever reason. 
Yeah. Although, once when I, this was a, a Guido trip to the Northern Territory with some listeners on a radio station I was working at, part of it uh, involved a chopper flight in the Northern Territory. And I've got a picture of me with the wig on and the tracksuit and all that sort of stuff next to a Sports Illustrated swimwear model who was the pilot. Uh, that time I was single and I can tell you, I was suddenly very interested in helicopters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mate. Uh, yeah, mate. It's, um, I can, I can imagine, <laughs> I, I can you, imagine you Guido's imagine. charm. You'd, you'd turn the charm on in that situation. You are imagining Tim right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, it's funny. There's a, a funny story. I was, I was looking up, um, oh, Paul and I have been watching SAS Australia Oh, yeah. And just started YouTubing, you know, SAS and looking up, you know, the Navy SEALs and all that sort of stuff. And, it, you know, you just go, go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. And I was watching an interview with uh, the the guy that shot Osama bin Laden yep. from, from the SEAL team. Irish surname. It's Neil O'Neill or it something. It is. It is O'Neill. Um, yeah. yeah, he's Irish. Yeah. Um, all, his, all his heritage. Yeah. Someone yeah. O'Neill. It's not, I'm like, what is it? Um, not Dave O'Neill, not Tony. <laughs> it could be Tony. It could be Tony O'Neill. I'm not sure. <laughs> But uh, definitely he was, not Dave O'Neill. He was no. saying, <laughs> he was saying that. Uh, so they they flew in in two choppers to get there. Yeah. One was supposed to land on the roof. One was going to land on the ground, and then they were going to attack from both both ends. Yep. If you know what I mean. And um, and uh, so, but something happened, and what they weren't expecting was one. I think the one that was going to land on the, or land in the in the courtyard of the compound. Because there's big walls, they didn't they didn't uh, factor in the uh, the the air, so it, it actually oh, lost. Effect. Yeah, it lost it lost yeah. control and it crashed. So it crashed in the in the courtyard. Anyway, the the other chopper landed somewhere else. I don't think they landed on the roof, but they landed somewhere else. And uh, one of the guys from that chopper, he uh, he was you know during the mission, he went onto the the radio and said, guys, guys, they're they're way more prepared than we thought. They've got a full-sized replica of our of our attack helicopter in the courtyard. So just be, be on alert. And then a few seconds later, after a pause, the captain goes, oh, that's that's our helicopter. It crashed. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, yeah, that, that would make a lot more sense. Yeah, that yeah. would make a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, well, from memory, that was there were some top secret features on that chopper. Mm. Am I right in remembering that? And they were very keen... For them not to fall into the hands of their extremely uh, untrustworthy ally, Pakistan. Mm, exactly. I think they did. They did blow it up on their way out, but there might have been fragments that that were still around. Um, I know there was an F one eleven that was uh, that was that crashed. Um, so the, the the stealth fighter that that crashed many years ago, and I can't remember which country it was. But uh, uh, see, the, the F-117 that crashed was F-117. Yep. in Belgrade, or it was in Serbia. It was flying over Serbia. And it's, I think, in a museum. Parts of it are in a museum in Belgrade, I think. That was, mm. oh, can we, I'm going to mention two, two facts about that that you might find interesting. Your confusion over the F-111 and F-117 was quite interesting. When the US Air Force was trying to get money for the stealth fighter as they called it it's not a fighter worth the name it's simply an attack aircraft they they submitted an appropriation bill to congress the century series f117 and there's a whole range of aircraft from the 60s the 100 101 102 104 105 106 108 then they went up to the the 110 became the f4 and then the 111, they pretty much stopped at the 111. What they did was to, in order to not arouse suspicion, they put in a line item for funding for a thing called the F-117. That was to not arouse suspicion because anybody would, looking at, would look at it and go, well, the F-117, they must want to upgrade an old 60s fighter um, because that, you know, they there was no way, had they gone with the sequence, it would have been, an F-19 or an F-21 or I could get into that, but, but we won't. But it would have been much lower number. So that's how they effectively snuck it past Congress. Um, and how that, that stealth aircraft got shot down was because it, it was simply taking the same route to the target from a, an airbase called Aviano in Italy. 
and they said so they were like the Germans with the uh, the Enigma Code in nineteen in the nineteen forties. They were just victims of their own complacency, and there, I think there was also some espionage or somebody somebody um, sold some information to the Serbs about where the aircraft would be at a certain time, and bang, they got it and they secured an enormous propaganda victory uh, for that. And so, just to get back to your point, I imagine the Americans would have been very keen to retrieve that, but I don't think they ever did. Mm. Mm. Um, they did. They definitely did do that with um, an F-14 that fell off an aircraft carrier in the late 70s, which had an incredibly good radar, um, the AWG-9, uh, which was linked to a missile with a range of 160 kilometres. And one fell overboard and the Americans went to an enormous and very expensive effort to deep dive and get the radar before the Russians did. And in the end, the Russians got all the secrets anyway when Iran fell in 1979 and the Iranians gave them uh, unlimited access to the F-14 that the United States had sold the Shah in uh, 1976. So there you go. Hmm. Well, I know, uh, I know like the F-22, uh, that's, that's one of my favourites. Uh, yeah. The Americans uh, put a rule in place or something that, that you, they couldn't sell it to any other country. That's um, right. However, the F-35, which uh, I guess replaces the F-22 in some respects, uh, you could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, yeah. that, that is an international aircraft. So the technology, it's, it's probably got more advanced technology than the mm. F-22. Well, it does because it was developed later. The, F, the F-22 was a part of a program called the ATF, which was to replace the F-15, which you mentioned earlier, the Advanced Tactical Fighter up against a Northrop aircraft called the YF-23. And if you want to see possibly one of the most amazing and awesome looking aircraft of all time, the YF-23 is it. Um, I think a much, well, not a much, but I think a demonstrably better aircraft than the YF-22, which eventually went on to be developed over the course of 15 very long years. It took a long time to get that uh, airframe right, but it's, an, you know, it's a superb airplane. Um, and then a law was passed that it could not be sold to any other nation. Australia would have been a, a lay down Maser for that aircraft. So would Singapore, South Korea, not Britain, because they would, they've been developing their own. There's one or two other countries in there that would have got it. But it was because of uh, Israel having, Israel was the other country that would have got it. But the Israelis had sold American technology to the Chinese and uh, the Americans weren't going to trust Israel with the F-22. But what's happened subsequently, you're right, there's been that whole enormous joint strike fighter program. Same company builds the F-22s, builds the F-35s, as you'd know, that's Lockheed. And um, some of the technology in the F-35 is pretty amazing. You would know about the, the camera system that's all around the aircraft. Are you aware of that? I'm um, not, no. It's the, the pilot has a visor, it weighs something like a kilo and a half um, over their eyes. So there's no head-up display in an F-35, which is a radical departure. What happens though is there's cameras mounted all around the aircraft. So the pilot, if the pilot looks down, he or she um, effectively is looking at the ground, not their legs. And they're all kind of integrated. So you can get this almost 360 degree view. Um, so some of the technology on that aircraft is, is really mm phenomenal but uh it's you know it's been a software driven airplane i think there's four million lines of code on it um which just dwarfs anything before it so you get the problems that you get with a software driven aircraft like that but the um it depends who you are some people just rate it very highly and others say it's just never going to work it's the, been the compromise of mm -hmm. trying to get an aircraft to replace the A-10, the F-16, the F-18. Um, and uh, good luck doing that because you end up with an aircraft designed by committee, which uh, which pleases no one. Yeah. Yeah, I could imagine, uh, imagine my luck. I'd be up in the, in the air, four million lines of code or whatever, and it would just crash to desktop um, when I'm up there <laughs> and you have to reset and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and off and on again. My my favorite, um, I've forgotten it. I think it might be a Harriet jet. Yeah. Um, is that the jet that, that lands like a helicopter? Is that? Yes. Yeah, I've always loved them. But I was watching a, a YouTube. Um, there's a YouTube channel that I watch. 
Um, it's called uh, Weekly Dose of Aviation or Daily Dose yeah. of Aviation um, by Lucas, I think. And there was a plane back in the 60s, uh, a long time ago. Okay. And um, it's, it's uh, I think, the, the system they use to stop the planes landing, uh, the slingshot or whatever it's called on the... Um, on the what's that the what, what's that sorry the, on the the catapult on the carrier yeah i think it well the, the thing that stops them is it the catapult that stops them oh the arrest hook or the arrest yeah. Um, yeah that that wasn't working so they lifted up this massive thing with a all these different bits of elastic or netting yeah. that just caught the plane yeah so how fast would that have been going and it just caught the plane and just stopped it in its tracks and i thought what a great invention because without that what would they have done? I don't know. Well, yeah, the the plane, depending on the size of the plane, and and mm. it's, it would have dumped fuel before it landed, because that yeah. is absolute last ditch. Um, well, actually, last ditch is is literally the last ditch. You yeah. uh, fly the aircraft alongside the carrier and eject, and a chopper comes to get you. But that way, they save the airplane. There's stru- a bit of structural damage, or there can be with that um, that yeah. arrestment, as they call it. Um, it'd be going. About 100 miles an hour easily. Yeah. So it's a lot of force going into that thing. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah, the the uh, the whole logistics of, of carriers are, wow. I, uh, you know, I, I could talk about them for an hour. And so that's why it's really interesting watching China get this carrier program going. Um, they're coming from a low base or, you know, from when I say low base, America, a lot of people forget, America has been running carriers for the best part of, 75 years mm. um no probably 80 years so you think of the corporate knowledge they have the chinese have only had a carrier i think in the last five or ten years some of their te- carrier technology came from us in australia when we sold them the hmas melbourne and they said oh look it's fine we'll pick it up and we'll uh, we'll just take it back to china and scrap it and we said yeah yeah no worries go your hardest and we said oh thank god that's done and the, strangely enough, they took a long time to scrap it. I wonder, I wonder why that was. Uh, they were just creating <laughs> blueprints or whatever for it. So they, they've ended up... Yeah, obviously, they, yeah. They have started to build their own. The, I think the, the functioning carry they've got at the moment was a, an ex-Russian one. But they are, I think they're pretty serious about um, building them. So mm. we'll see how that goes. But they're, they're very difficult, complex things to operate. I'm sure newer uh, Chinese brand, uh, they probably sell a carrier on, on Amazon now, Paul, because they, they seem to sell <laughs> yeah. everything. They, they, they do knockoffs of, of every other brand yeah. and bring out their own version. So, yeah. Well, you could probably, on a good day at Aldi, you would be able to get a ship capable <laughs> nuclear reactor uh, yeah. in the middle aisle. Have to line up, have to line yeah. up for that one. Exactly. Um, you do. You yeah. do. So, um, have you, have you had uh, yeah. yeah sorry no, tim no, you um, go, have you had much have you had much uh experience with i mean we've talked about fighter jets and things like that but i'm just thinking of one of my favorite aviation stories which is sully uh, oh, landing yeah. on the hudson river um are you into are you into that sort of aircraft as well the 747s yeah. 737s yeah. a330s love that thing? love all that um and i know a couple of pilots and mm. um it's funny pilots get a they get almost competitive or uh, they they don't want to be seen to acknowledge what a an absolutely brilliant bit of making that was and uh, what a great bit of flying it was. Mm. Um, but like any you know, so the, I think the three of us here would would just be in awe of the presence of mind that he had, and you know again uh, he's great military training. He I think he flew Phantoms in the U.S. Air Force. And you would have seen the movie, which I think does a great job of, hmm. of just um, showing how compressed that decision time was. Um, absolutely remarkable stuff. And I love the fact that that aircraft is now in a museum. I, th- yeah. I think that's. I think the whole story is wonderful. The fact that you can land on water, and it's it's so common for planes to break up into three pieces, uh, unless you land perfectly. He did a really yeah. good job. Yeah. Really good job. And then it just floated there obligingly. Yeah. And everyone was on the wing. I think, I don't know if this is true, but I'm, yeah, I'd almost believe it that there were passengers on board who got to dry land 
without getting wet. Hmm. There you it's go. Pretty amazing. Hmm. Um, you know, when you think of certain World War II fighters that you couldn't land on water, if you want to Google a plane called the Typhoon or the Tempest, which had a huge, um, I think it was a radiator at the front, a chin scoop, they're called. And uh, if you landed that one, it would immediately go on its back. And that was that was game over. There was no way you were getting out of that. Hmm. So, um, and, and the conventional wisdom was that you couldn't do that with... Uh, an aircraft, a passenger aircraft of that configuration. It just wasn't going to happen. Mm. Well, we've, we've got a, a pilot uh, who's a fan of the show, uh, Tim and Tony. Shout out to Lockie. Um, oh. He flies the A330s with oh, Qantas. Wow. Um, yeah. But prior to that, let's see if I get this right, he flew Gulfstream 4, Gulfstream 5, and Global oh. Express oh, uh, yeah. privately. These jets, yeah. Um, so he was flying them, but obviously moved to, to Qantas. He's taking a bit of time off at the moment, obviously, due to the, the whole situation. Um, but he'll be back in no time flying them. So shout out to Lockie. Hmm. Good on you, Lockie. Well, I, we want to see them back. It's a very sad hmm. sight. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. There's a great website called airliners.net where you can go. And some guy's either taken a drone or he's flown over the boneyard in Alice Springs, um, which has been a bit of a success story. you really got to congratulate the guy whose idea it was to... Hmm. to let airlines park their aircraft in Alice Springs. But this guy's uh, taken a shot of, of uh, A380s, Singapore A380s, the irony being that Australian A380s are over in America. Um, it's a it's a really sad image. It's, it's not where they should be. I think we could all agree. Yeah. Hmm. So something that goes with flying, uh, whiskey. So, so Tony, yes. you've got a, uh, an Irish heritage. Yes. Um, yeah, do you get into the Irish whiskies? Well, I've only um, I've only got into it of late. Um, of what used to happen when we when I was a kid and we had growing pains, I'd go into mum and dad's bedroom and tap mum on the shoulder, and say I can't sleep, and she would do this automatically. She would get up, boil a kettle, pour half a tumbler of hot water, a shot of whiskey, and a spoonful of sugar hand it to me and then go back to bed. <laughs> uh, you can try, I don't know if you guys have tried that with your kids, but it works. I've heard people mention it. It's, um, it's one of those things that like that sort of generation, um, yes, yeah, to yeah. give kids whiskey. It's, um, yeah. a bit of a worry, but, uh, um, I guess, look, look how we all turned out. So, um, <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, that, that was probably endorsed by the Irish Medical Association, I'd say. Uh, it was well within a yeah. child's recommended daily intake of uh, single malt. Yeah. Um, so as I, uh, as I grew up, I, I, had a, uh, I had a couple of bad experiences on scotch, so I never went back to it until recently when I uh, happened to get about four bottles for my 50th. And I had a Jamison. I'm not sure which one it is, but... I remember texting a mate who'd always been into scotch and I said, uh, a baby's bum is no longer the measure for smoothness. Cause that, <laughs> that stuff was extraordinary. Yeah. It was amazing. So I've got, but I've got a brother who's very much into, um, into whiskey as well. And I recently sent an uncle in Ireland on behalf of my mother a bottle of Tasmanian whiskey and it's ah. got very favorable reviews and he knows his stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I take it you're a bit of fan of the, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of whiskey. Uh, yeah. Paul, I know Paul isn't, uh, so I think Paul brought or bought his brother-in-law a bottle of Laphroaig, which is real, real smoky peaty whiskey. Yeah. And, uh, do you want to tell the story, Paul, what happened? Well, I mean, there's not much of a story, but if you're happy to drink, jet fuel um <laughs> that's pretty much what it tasted like yep. i uh, i took it i was meeting him for the first time and um <laughs> sadly obviously my my partner's dad had passed away so um the the next guy in the family was obviously um my soon-to-be brother-in-law so i wanted to impress him and i turned up with a the best bottle of whiskey i could afford at the time yeah um and but i don't i don't personally drink myself yeah. um but he didn't know that so he fixed me a glass and said, here, have a drink with me and um, try not to disappoint him. I thought I'll just take a bit of a sip. 
and I'm not joking when I said jet fuel, it tasted like absolute trash. I can't even describe it. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, <clears throat> pretty good. And uh, I put it down and I let the ice melt through and then I tipped it down the sink and hope he doesn't watch this because he'll know what really happened. But uh, how do you drink that stuff? It tastes, it's like drinking an ashtray from a, a cup holder in a car that's been yeah. burnt out in uh, poured with gasoline. It's disgusting. Disgusting. Well, I think it's a, look, it's an acquired taste. I don't, I'm an irregular drinker of scotch. I'm just, I'm just, Fortunate in that the scotch I do drink is quite nice, and that's by accident. Um, that uh, that stuff that you mentioned is, uh, I think, designed to put hairs on your chest, the chest, and probably a, um, I don't know, some sort of test. Uh, I failed. You you did fail, but I I look I I think you failed honourably. Um, it's not for everyone that sort of thing. You'd need to be uh, Boris Yeltsin to knock that sort of thing back without complaint so um i think it's uh, wonderful you just gave it a try it's about a mature well, palate don't... paul you, you just don't have a mature palate like like tony I, and I, myself i'm very very mature but I, it's funny tony i was at uh at tim's house the other day um a couple of weeks ago and i talk about whiskey um you've got an, an aviation sort of passion tim has got a clear passion for whiskey yeah. i turned up to his house and i went to the pantry to get something and there was just all these vials, like hundreds, thousands of little vials. And I thought, is Tim doing steroids? What is this? <laughs> and uh, I pull one and it's like, you know, uh, Jamison, 12-year-old whiskey sample. Like, what? They're all whiskey samples. You can buy whiskey samples. Mm. I did not yet know you could buy whiskey samples, but Tim had just hundreds as far as the eye could see. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've got I've got a ton of them, and uh, so yeah, I've tried lots. And the smoky ones, the big bold smoky ones, are my favourite. The ones that just smell like band aid mixed with leather, um, mixed with ashtray. Oh, just it's, mm, yeah, yeah, it's just delicious. So um, yeah, I mean, I think everyone's got a like a lot of people, you know, buy the cheap whiskey when they're young and and then have a bad experience, and then that puts them off. Yeah. But then when you try yeah. when you try really good ones that have been aged for the right amount of time and crafted from good brands, it's a different it's a whole different world. So Well there's and there's a certain sophistication to it that doesn't come with beer. Um, maybe it's matched by wine, but yeah, I, I, like I say, my, my brother can speak very eloquently about the appeals of single malts and I, I couldn't even tell you the difference between a single malt or which country spends whis spells whiskey with an E and which one doesn't? I can um, I can answer I that question. Know. I can answer the question if can the country yes, if the country has an E in in the name of the country, they spell it with it with an E. Oh, that's magnificent! So Ireland yeah. has an E, I R E L A N D. America yeah. has an E. Australia doesn't. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, Australia doesn't have an E. Uh, Scotland, Scotland doesn't. Um, Japan, J A P A doesn't. Yeah. So yeah, if there's an E in the country, you spell it with E Y. If there's no E, it's just Y. Right. That is a great rule of thumb. Yeah. I didn't even you know whiskey in Japan. You're right. They made it there. Well, Japan mm. and uh, and Tasmania, they're they're um they're both doing really well. They won uh, like the World Whiskey Awards um, in recent years. So yeah, it's really the, the demand for those two areas has gone right up. Um, do you remember the one you bought from the Tasmanian one you bought? I don't. I'm afraid. I actually I bought a when we were in Japan. I bought a bottle of scotch there because I I thought well I want to try a Japanese scotch. It was really nice. It was also really affordable. It was in like their equivalent of a Seven Eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Just it was as easy as that. And it, like I said. Um, at the end of the day, to have a, a tumbler of that with a couple of ice cubes was a very nice way to finish the day, and it mm. was—it uh, seemed like a very Japanese thing to do. But I, I don't know what poor bastard's job it was to break to the Scottish that they didn't win the best whiskey in the world. Yeah, I'd, I'd want to be doing that at a safe distance. And it reminds <laughs> me of the old saying: "The man who tells the truth should have one foot in the stirrup." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I thought you were going to say in the steroids. 
Nanoplastic well, one <laughs> But Tony, I'm, I'm listening to you talk about planes. It reminds me of, uh, I'm not sure if you watched SAS Australia, but um, the, the big, serious, tough blokes, you know, short guys, big muscles. Yeah. Um, and, and they get Merrick um, into a room and they said, what do you do for a living, Merrick? And he goes, I'm a comedian. And yeah. they're like, whatever. He's the most serious guy on the show. And I'm just thinking, you are one of the funniest men I have ever listened to in general conversation, in when you're trying to be funny, when you're writing for TV shows. And this whole podcast so far has just been <laughs> your serious side. Yeah. I'm just wondering, do you, do you just, does comedy come natural to you or do you sit there and actually write? Like I'm, I'm trying to figure out how an Irish born Australian um, creates uh, an alter ego as a, a Greek Adonis. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering whether there's other characters that you do or whether he was the first character or did you and Julian Schiller from uh, Crud develop other characters and Guido just was the one that hit? Like, how, yeah. how's the, I want to get into yeah. the mind of a comedy writer, I guess, is what I'm getting oh, Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think you get better at it as you get older. It's it's like anything. I think you, you hone... Uh, a comic sensibility. Mm. Um, as with Guido, I, I'm probably at risk of telling the the story for the hundredth time, but it's uh, it's interesting nonetheless. He, he was a an amalgamation of people. Jules and I came up with Guido when we were about twenty, probably about twenty five. And then started doing the prank calls in about 98 when we were over at Triple M. Um, but the first time we ever did him was on a, a live show that we were doing at the Prince Pat's. Um, and it was a QA and a thing. So Jules would just ask me questions and, you know, and I was dressed up in the wig and the tracksuit and all that sort of stuff. The Prince Pat had quite a high stage. It was probably about a metre and a bit, over a metre. And... Um, <laughs> I'll never forget this. As, as Jules was asking me the questions and I was waiting for him to finish, I looked down at a guy in the front row who was sitting like this. I'll see if I can get it. He just, he had his arms crossed and he was just looking up at me. Now, this, this is about the third or fourth character I'd done that night. So it was no surprise who was playing this character. But anyway, he had his arms crossed and a real look on his face and he just looked up at me and went, It was just bizarre that it, it got that kind of reaction. He mm. just the, the kind of contempt that he had was, I just thought, ridiculous and just kind of really strange. But so it went from there as a, as a combination of two people, uh, a mate of Jules, who I'll give you an example. He was, and he's a terrific bloke, but he's as vain as the day is long. He loves working out. And he has an enormous appetite, this bloke. I won't mention his name, but this was a classic story of this bloke. He would come over to Jules's place. He was a family friend. He would go to the, um, the freezer and take out the new tub of ice cream and then put six scoops in a bowl, sometimes seven. You think, okay, he's, he's hungry for ice cream. He would put that bowl in the freezer <laughs> and then polish off the ice cream tub. <laughs> and, and he... He just had this kind of way about him that he could, he had the gift of the gab. Um, he was very conscious of his appearance. And uh, so there was that. And then my brother was dating these Greek girls when he was at, at uni and they would come round and they would always have a male chaperone with them. And one of these guys was just a gift to, to anybody interested in comedy. He was, <laughs> I've, I've told this story. So if, 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 You've heard it before. I haven't, podcast. no. His name was Jim and he came around one day. Jim was obsessed with working out, kickboxing, cars, girls, and not being thought of as gay. That was so high in his hierarchy of, <laughs> of uh, I don't know, importance. It, it was phenomenal. Um, but he came around one day and said, Tony, I've got a new job. Because it was my job to look after him while Pete went, to the car park with this girl and did whatever you do when you're 19. Let's just put it that way. So 
it was my job to babysit Jim. So we would talk and he would go, Tony, I've got a car. I've got a job. I said, oh, that's great, Jim. Where's the job? Mate, it's at a service station. Oh, okay. Um, uh, how much are they paying you? Oh, nothing. I get to look at cars all day. And so you, you had that kind of meets meets the other yeah. kind of component of the character and it all just kind of gelled pretty quickly. And so the, the first phone call that we ever did was to the Chevron nightclub. And uh, it was Guido ringing up the manager there. So, Mara, I've got a problem uh, because uh, two nights ago I was there with my entourage and uh, you did not give us drink cards to the value of $10,000. Mate, uh, that has uh, cast a shadow over my enjoyment of your nightclub. And there was a pause and the guy, the guy just, he kind of went along with it and the call petered out and, and hung up. But then the producer rang back to speak to the manager of the Chevron nightclub. And he said, oh, that was a prank call. And the guy said, I thought it was real. I get calls like that every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, the funny, th that's, I think one of the funny things about Guido is that he's not that far-fetched. Like, I reckon there's people I, I've, I've known that speak exactly like that. Yeah. So. My, my, my brother-in-law, Tim, uh, soon to be, he, when I, when I, when I taught, I was, would, we started this podcast and, um, and I was trying to think of uh, Tim. Tim would do an impression of Batman. And by the way, uh, when you started talking about someone being vain, always in the gym, eating ice cream, yeah. always thinks to themselves, I thought you were describing Tim. Um, <laughs> but I started doing this Guido voice, which, by yeah. the way, is nowhere near as good as yours. And and my boys are like, that's just like Uncle Paul, the other uncle. You know, not me, but the Uncle Paul. I was like, well, maybe I do sound like him a little bit. Yeah. But um, I was going to ask you actually, is that what happens? You do a prank call and then. Do they uh, do they find out that it was a prank call for you to put it on a CD? Do they have to know? Do they have to get permission? Yes, you've got to get permission. And so we yeah. had to get. There would be oftentimes you would do a great call and people are laughing and you know and, and it sounds great. And then it was always the producer who would ring back and say, mm. "Look, that was a prank call. I think you might have uh, understood that. Do you mind if we play it?" And the person would be laughing. They'd go, "Oh, you got me a beauty. You got me a beauty. If you play that, I'll sue." Yeah. And then. <laughs> And then the flip side of that was the tow truck driver, um, who was the guy who was a guy that Dermy knew. This is a triple M. So Dermy said, "You've got to give this guy a call. He's got a really short fuse." <laughs> and you know, and he he just went off. He was just fuck. Ah, he, he was in injury. And then um, rang back, and I think it was his girlfriend who answered the phone. She said, "Yeah, fuck it, play it." <laughs> and that was that. And it was uh, uh, so. They're, they're, you know, sometimes people would say yes, sometimes they wouldn't. And if they didn't, you couldn't play it. Yeah. Um, well, my, my friend, my, one of my best mates, shout out to Serge, um, his mate runs a business now, which is named after um, the, the towing call. And his business is called Hello Towing. Uh, oh, because when you called, uh, oh. yeah, mate, the guy goes, hello, towing. <laughs> hello, towing. And uh, <laughs> that's what they called it. But how did you get permission from the, the Vatican? I mean, that guy was like, oh, I beg, beg your pardon. I beg uh, your the, pardon. That's the palace, the palace, uh, Paul. Palace. Yeah, Bucking the palace, hair. yeah. Uh, uh, Nana Muscuri and Nana can sleep on my, my couch, mate, you know? Like, how do you get permission from well, him? With, with some of the big ones, I think you, you kind of roll the dice and think that they're not going to come after you. Um, so there was that. Or there, oh, okay, right. Yeah, or, of course. Or there may have been some skullduggery behind that one. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> It's it's great, but uh, I can I can feel the urge. I can feel the a Guido urge coming on soon, Tim. So I'll get prepared for that in a minute. But um, did you have anything else you wanted to to talk about before I get in costume? <laughs> um, well, maybe maybe Paul, while you're doing that, I'd I'd like to ask Tony, yeah, if you have a favourite out of all the the prank calls you, you either that either aired or didn't air, do you yeah. have a favourite one? Um. The plumber still makes me smile. I love the woman in the masseuse. I just think she's just such a gorgeous woman. Um, the tow truck driver, I love him for being as crabby as he was and as cooperative as he was. And it was just a, it was, it just, it sounds 
<laughs> yeah. Sounds great when you listen to this poor bastard just getting a clobbering <laughs> from an absolute idiot with a phone. <laughs> uh, so oh, he's got the wig. I love it. Uh, <laughs> Um, so there, and then there was an appearance with Matthew Hardy that was a lot of fun. That was on the big schmooze. Um, winning the Aria Award was fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, two Arias, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, mate. Did you win two Arias, mate? I don't want two. Count them. <laughs> mate, one. Probably can't get that high. Yeah, mate. One for each pectoral muscle, mate. That's right. I might have got two. One for uh, the amount of women you've almost had sex with. Mate, what a loser. Yeah, mate. Mate, I never thought I'd say this, mate, but I was like looking in a mirror, mate. Mate, yeah, what a good looking man, mate. Called ugly. Yeah, mate. How can I laugh, mate, when I'm wearing this? The girls get the girls, mate. Shout out to Vince Colosimo, mate. The girls get the girls, mate. Mate, the only thing you got is herpes from your right hand. Yeah, mate. I got no comebacks for you, mate, because you are just so good looking, mate. mate like, I don't know what to do. Well, mate. <clears throat> You know, most people that are in their mother's tummy for nine months, I was there for a year and a half while God got me absolutely right. You cannot afford to make mistakes with a face like this. Yeah, mate, mate, you came out, mate. I saw you, mate. You kickboxing the nurse when you came out, mate. Mate, you electric boogaloo, mate. Mate, I took her down. She moved suspiciously. Mate, you cannot afford to make mistakes. <laughs> mate, when I came out of my mother's womb, mate, it was it was frightening. I was crying because there were a lot of loud noises. That was mainly the applause. Yeah, mate. Mate, I do not fault you, mate. You got pectoral, mate. Mate, my pectorals are having a party, mate, and you are invited, mate. Yeah, mate. Uh, you know what? I don't think I'll RSVP to that because that sounds like uh, uh, not a fun party. You, mate, they look like the sort of the bottom of a jumping castle, mate. Big, fat, and flabby. Not chiseled by the hand of God like me, mate. Yeah, mate. I'm, it's very hard to be serious, mate. mate when I am uh, in the presence, mate, of a true Greek God, mate. I can only dream one day. Mate, I dream about you all the time, mate. Let me tell you. Well, mate, I would not be the first man who's had that horror. Uh, <laughs> but that's all right, mate. What we can do, I can take you to the Gura Hatsis Academy. It's like an academic institution. And there, mate, you will be taught the basics of becoming the Greek god. With you, it will take a lot of patience, plastic surgery, and kicks to the nuts. Yeah, mate. mate well, have you got any uh, tips for me, mate, to get the women, man? I mean, I don't know, I have much trouble, mate, but I do would like some... Uh, you got any tips for me? Mate, tips for you. Yeah, mate. Yeah, um, mate. Don't leave the house. Not tits, tips. Okay. Mate, you got any tits for me, mate? Mate, I'm, uh, mate, I am a good-looking uh, Greek Adonis. I'm not a magician. Mate, here's what you should do, mate. Tell them that you know good Ahatsis. Yeah, mate. They will be like putty in your hands, in your flabby, sweaty hands, mate. <laughs> That's yeah, mate, it does not matter what I say, mate. You come back with the better comebacks instantaneously, <laughs> mate. Mate, it's like you've had years of experience. Mate, it's unbelievable. What I take is uh, like a, a <laughs> Bulgarian horse-derived comeback steroid. Yes, mate, it may have shrunk my katul to at least one inch and may have taken 90 years off my life, but it is worth it. Yeah, mate. mate you know what, mate? I've still got the hair, mate. Mate, I think you're losing a bit of hair in your old age, mate. But me, mate, I got the curls still, mate. Mate, I got that. I'm been drinking from the fountain of youth, mate. Well, mate, you got the curls. I'll keep the girls. Yeah, mate. <laughs> this is a this is an absolute masterclass of uh, of Guido Hetzis. Yeah. yeah, mate. Mate, I learned from the best, mate. And I just wanted to say thank you, mate, for the uh, the uh, the Guido inspiration, mate. Because without you, mate, I would have saved. Mate, mate, 50 bucks, mate, for this stupid bullshit wig, mate. Let me tell you. Well, mate, do well, not talk over me, mate. Mate, well, I speak. Well, I speak, you listen, mate. Okay? Well, yeah, mate. I, I offer my humble apologies. I Thank you, mate. I will do that again. Mate, I want you to bow down, mate, and you lick my feet, mate. Mate, because you know what? Because it will taste like the whiskey with an E, mate, you'd be you been drinking, mate. Mate, they call it whiskey with an E in Greece, mate, because that's got two E's in it. All yeah, right. 
And mate, I think the only thing more powerful than that that can knock you out is your armpit. After uh, <laughs> after you lifting lifting your two kilo burger that you have for breakfast. Yeah, mate, mate, that's super lucky burger, mate. Mate, I got the gyros and the uh, the the uh, what's that? Uh, the sauce, mate. Mate, you know the sauce. Tzatziki. Tzatziki, uh, mate. You gotta yeah, know mate. what it is, All right? Yeah, it's, mate. Uh, made from uh, yogurt. You've got the yogurt. You've got uh, cucumber. You've got lemon. You've got uh, mate. You've got a whole heap of bushy you put in there, and uh, then you sell it to some dumb skiff for nine hundred bucks. Don't ask any questions, mate. All right? Yeah, mate. All right, <laughs> mate. Do not talk over me, mate. But it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I would love to talk to you some more soon. Mate, I've got to say it's been an absolute pleasure for you to speak to me. Yeah, mate. All yeah, right. mate. Mate, thank you, Guido. Mate, take care, Guido. Mate, I'll speak to you when you're next uh, next available, okay? Mate, uh, I will have a look at my schedule, and uh, if there's a tiny opening, maybe I will come by and visit you and uh, introduce you to one of my best friends. He's certainly, mate, he's got two names, Nun and Chaka. <laughs> yeah, mate. Mate, I tell you what, mate, next time we talk, mate, I will not charge you my appearance for you, mate. Mate, that's good because... Uh, I don't know where I was going to get 15 cents from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, I'm, yeah, mate, I'm so out of my depth, mate. I'm going to have to take this down, I'll take this off. <laughs> mate, I come back and speak to you like normal, okay? Okay. Oh, yeah. God, I'm dead. So just while you're doing that, so we, um, we'll, we'll have to wrap up in a minute, um, oh. but it's been a, no, it's been a pleasure nerding out about uh, military aviation, whiskey, and then um, the masterclass of Guido. So, what an episode. There is, just, there is nothing, nothing I could have said um, <laughs> that you, you just had the perfect everything for everything that I said. Everything. Well, it, it's, it's, there's, there's a pathway in my brain after 20 years of doing it. So, uh, so <clears throat> it's just motor neurons firing as soon as that voice kicks in. Did, um, but that was a lot of fun. That was a did, hell of a lot yeah. of fun. Did, did I hear that you once, um, I know that Charlie Chaplin came second in a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest. Yeah. Did <laughs> I hear that you, you called the radio uh, as Guido and the, the guy thought it was a terrible impression? True story. 100% <laughs> true. It was on the road to Geelong to do an in-store there. And I think it was about day 10 of a you know, pretty punishing um publicity schedule mm. for the for the first album and um we were listening to this it might have been k-rock yeah and the guy was speaking like guido and he said yeah ring up now and do your impersonation and so the record company guy handed me a phone and i just like you say i said yeah mate it's good i want to be a part of your uh your little <laughs> impersonation competition and it, <laughs> Mind you, he'd been putting people to wear who were rubbish, who were genuinely rubbish. And there was a pause and he just goes, mate, that's the worst impersonation of Guido I've ever heard and hung up. That is 100% true. Unbelievable. Wow. Just as well it wasn't Bay FM, Paul, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Craig. Craig. Bay I FM. I don't know. Yeah. It sounds like a K-Rock thing to do, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, Tony and Guido, um talking so yeah thank you thank you so much for coming on and uh yeah we've, we've had a great time so it's been fantastic well thank you tim thank you paul and i'd uh, i'd love to be back at some point um just shooting the breeze and, and talking about whatever i've really really enjoyed speaking to you guys so um uh if you'd love to have me back or you, even if you'd be lukewarm about the idea of having me back um i would uh, i'd very much enjoy it Absolutely, I reckon that'd be, I think, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think I think I can speak. For, oh, yeah, I think I'll speak on behalf of Tim. But yeah, it'd be great to have you back. And I was talking to Tim during the week, and I said that um, you know, no one when you're really passionate about something, no one cares. No one wants to listen to True. you. No one. Sh True. I try and talk to my kids yep. about things I'm passionate about, and they're just they glaze over. They don't care, and um, you find yourself just trying to force it onto them almost. If you know <laughs> what I mean. I'll tell you what happened last time. I, I twisted the arm of my wife and two kids to go to an aircraft museum in Port Adelaide that was having an engine test run day, which is just mm. awesome. So they'll fire, they've got a Griffin there and they've got a Merlin and all these engines. And they were, they were running them just on these static test rigs. 
and there's an F-111 there, and there's a World War II Spitfire there with a Volks filter on it, and there's an F-27 there. I mean, what more do you need to get excited about an aircraft museum? Anyway, so I'm walking around, and it's actually an RF-111. It was the recon version. And I'm walking around that, and uh, I turn around to see my wife whispering to our two children who then both start nodding vigorously. They then turn and walk quickly to the car to drive away. <laughs> Leaving me with a text message that said, can't do museums anymore. See you in an hour. Well, as, as Jerry Seinfeld once said, there is no such thing as fun for the whole family. <laughs> so true. it sounds that's like... So true. Sounds like that's that's what's happened there. It's just yeah. it's just not fun for everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Great point. Great point mm. indeed. So on that note, uh, we'll say goodbye. And if you join us, we do it like a salute. So um, and that's it. That's all from on board for delivery. Good night. And that's a wrap. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Awesome. Oh, disaster. Thanks.